Hi everyone, this is Chris Barrow from the Naked Gaming Podcast with a special episode of the podcast now focusing on the world of chess and the computer algorithms that are now so powerful that a grandmaster would have almost no chance of beating it. How am I supposed to do it? We were inspired to make this episode after watching The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, which is the story of Beth Harmon's rise to the top of the chess world. Our guest for this episode of The Pod is Natasha Regan, who's a woman international master at chess, has represented England and co-authored a book called Game Changer, which tells the story of an algorithm that can learn to play chess to an incredible level called Alpha Zero. If you could subscribe to the podcast, it would help us out. That's my opening gambit over. Enjoy. When I started, I must have been about eight years old, maybe even slightly younger than that. And um, and my father had used to play a little bit of chess at university, but he didn't even really play. And there was a, um, a chess book advertised on the back of a cereal packet. And so we ordered that. I'd always liked kind of puzzles and, and, and games. Um, and I learned chess and I got instantly hooked on chess um, and what I was very lucky with in my area was that there was this junior chess club um, it was only a few miles from my house and I would go every Monday night wouldn't miss a single week um, full of lots of kids my own age and uh, so it was it was the sort of fun aspect as well as the games aspect the social um, side of things know. came into it I guess at that point did it yeah, so so it was it was and a little bit at school, but it was mainly this club, and uh, and and so we'd um, we'd all kind of be a similar level and improve together, and um, and then what happened was we started going into competitions together as well, um, and so it was yeah very sociable, uh, but also we would care about who would win each game at the oh, club each true. week, and and so we'd want to we'd we'd know who were the players who were in our league, and we'd have little competitions within the club, and we'd always want to um, make sure we won against the the people we we thought we had a good chance against, and and so um, yeah, it was just just really nice um, atmosphere. There was there was a, a, a chap called Roly Newton who was the kind of coach of the club, and he would tell us where we were going wrong or what we were doing right. Um, but most of the time, they just left us to play. And, and that's what we wanted to do, just play against each other um, and learn ourselves what were the good moves and the bad moves and, and, and those tricky forks with the knights. That was that was what we <laughs> always specialise on. It's always something very satisfying when you can pull off a, a move. And when you, it's almost like um, when you see something uh, and you can, you, you can obviously, you know, imagine positions and play ahead in chess quite a lot and a lot of these computer algorithms that I want to come on to you know they're essentially processing as many moves as they possibly can in a certain time and working out the best eventual outcome when you're a kid you 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 like to um think of these little traps like if the opponent doesn't see it then um then you can you can get this trap um and and you're calculating ahead like that and then as you get to more a competitive level then it's not really traps you're going for, but you're still thinking ahead. Um, but it's, it's then can you kind of uh, steer the game in the direction you want it to go um, and, and, and get towards the positions you, either the good positions or positions that you like to play. Like the ones that you've kind of learned patterns of. And, and I guess there's, yeah. there's a lot of talk, and actually in this Netflix series, about um, aggressive play and kind of workmanlike play and different yeah. uh, styles. And I guess people like watching the aggressive and, and more flair kind of style of play what's the difference between you know like a workman style and somebody who has a bit of flair for chess is it that you're simply not just following the established patterns of a kind of a usual game until the middle end point of the game well it's funny because there have been kind of trends in chess and so different periods of history then you get very different styles of play um, certainly traditionally in the romantic eras there was lots of sacrificing material um, and getting very early decisive attacks and that would partly be because the play was a little bit weaker in those days mm. and so you were able to achieve it there was also a difference in strength between the strongest players and um, and the people they're playing against and so they might your opponent might bring the queen out too early and you could gain a lot of time attacking it um, and then get these kind of brilliant attacks um, with lots of sacrifices. Then then there was kind of a period in history where um, you would have a bit more of a solid style, 
there was things like the pawn is the soul of chess and you build up these pawn structures and and it's a little bit more positional um I'm thinking of positional players uh, move, moving a lot forward in time than uh, someone like Karpov in the 1970s. And he was renowned for uh, getting a small advantage in the game and, and then maybe, you know, just building up the advantage very, very slowly, very positionally, and there's nothing the opponent could do. And then um, then around that time, there was another very exciting player, Gary Kasparov. And mm-hmm. and, um, and that match was 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 big, big news, the, the sort of, exciting attacking player of Kasparov against Karpov's positional play. Uh, you also had um, Bobby Fischer, the, 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 the very famous American player, world champion, who um, kind of sparked off a lot of interest in chess in the 1970s. Um, and, and he, uh, apart from being a very exciting character, he also had um, this, this kind of open and attacking style of chess play, quite a, quite a, a sort of simple style, positional, uh, but, but, um, but direct and against the king. Um, and then sort of more recently, you've got um, Magnus Carlsen, current world champion. And I mean, he is a good attacker. Uh, he also, though, makes a lot out of um, small advantages and he can carry on playing a game forever. He just yeah. uh, keeps, uh, it, like, say, in an end game, he, if he has any kind of advantage, he is just renowned for winning those because he has these little tricks in the end game and, um, and, can, and can make a lot of his advantage. Um, and, and then if you look in computer chess, you've, got, you've also got these, these differences in style. So um, the computer that that uh, a traditional engine that had been the strongest stockfish was a um, very very good calculator and an extremely good defender so whilst you might think you could kind of play against it sacrifice your pieces and um, and get some kind of plus it would always pull something out of the bag and um, and manage to successfully defend um, through pure calculation um, and also through the sort of understanding that um, people had built up. It's a perfect yeah. moment actually to talk about um, Alpha Zero, which I was reading yeah. about only yesterday, and, and I know you've written about this, obviously. It's a, it, so it's kind of uh, the latest computer program. And from my understanding is that it will sit down and learn a game in four yeah. or five hours with kind of um, the algorithms that it's built up. So it doesn't have to even be chess. It can be Go, which is another hugely yeah. uh, popular yeah. game. And it will sit and kind of, learn a game and then it, at the moment it's almost unbeatable if you look at the rates that it has against older algorithms and models it's winning like 80 90 percent of games or, or drawing the rest so uh, yeah. this is clearly a, a development but what's different about this this alpha zero so it's very interesting so this was built by deep mind um and it was called alpha zero because it had zero human knowledge in it. So the traditional engines might have been told the value of a queen is such and such, and a doubled pawn is worth such and such, and being near the king is such and such. Alpha Zero was different. It was uh, sort of self-taught. So it it did know the rules of chess. Um, What it did was then play um, 44 million games at lightning fast speed against itself. And uh, starting completely random. So at first, it, most of the games would end in a draw because it didn't really know anything about chess and, and couldn't really make any progress. But by chance, some games would be decisive. And then what it would do is then look at the kind of moves it had played where it had won and try and play a little bit more like that. Look at the moves where it had lost because it was playing against itself mm-hmm. um, and try and play a little bit less than that. Um, and so then it would kind of play more and more, and then build up a picture of what patterns were good for it um, and and how to become stronger and stronger. And it, it was phenomenally successful. But as you say, it did it not just for chess, um, but also with Go and Shogi. So um, this it, Alpha Zero became the strongest computer um, and stronger than all humans at um, chess, Go and Shogi. And actually, the journey was started with Go. Um, where traditionally computers hadn't made such progress against humans. Um, and DeepMind were quite brave. They challenged kind of the person that was considered the best uh, Go player um, to a televised match, um, which took place in 2016. Um, and it was, it was big, big news, like millions of viewers around the world um, in Korea. 
uh, the match took place. Uh, so Korea, uh, China and Japan are the countries that are really big for Go. Mm. Um, and, and all the professionals thought that the um, human would win because Go is played on a much bigger board than chess. It's played mm. on a 19 by 19 board. And so there's a lot of choice for each move. So the traditional approach for computers there um, of just calculating, they, they very quickly ran out of being able to do it just because of so many combinations. Um, Alpha Zero took a, a, a combined approach of kind of positional features and shape recognition, um, looking at what are the likely moves and then how, how does it evaluate the position after that? And it was able to get stronger where other computers hadn't been able to do it. And in the end, the match was 4-1 to, um, to the computer, which was called AlphaGo at the time. Um, and there's this absolutely fantastic film about it. I highly recommend it called AlphaGo. Um, and it shows the story. It's got real footage from the match. And it just shows all the emotions, you know, coming back to chess, all the emotions of, of being a, a Go player or a chess player, um, of what you feel in tournament and winning and losing. Um, and it, it's just a really fantastic film about the story of um, AlphaGo and the match against uh, Lee Seidel. Stop kidding around, Snake. Snake! I wanted to ask you this because I know um, as a, someone who's incredibly well respected in, in the chess world as well as, you know, understanding this, how this kind of mm. all works, um, does it spoil any of the games? to have a computer that's almost unbeatable? Because I saw a quote from one, I think it's a Danish chess grandmaster who said, it's like playing against a, an alien. You know, it, it's just so good uh, that you almost can't beat it as a human. But does that does yeah. that ruin chess? Does that ruin Go? Or does that, um, I suppose, become the aspiration for, for human players? It's kind of, it's kind of there's, there's, there's lots of things to that question. And it's, it's kind of brought new possibilities that we didn't know about on the chessboard. I mean, actually in chess for a little while, computers have been stronger than humans. So there was a um, famous match of Kasparov against Deep Blue. It okay. was a two, a two series match and Kasparov won the first and then Deep Blue won the second. So, and, and then after that, computers have got a lot stronger. Um, so, so, it, so, so kind of people are, are used to using computers as a tool to help them play chess um, as opposed to trying to to beat them anymore just because they're so strong, um, it does it does uh, actually in our online world now it is it's quite nice having the computers um, in terms of spectating chess because um, you've got a lot of chess going on online at the moment and what you can do um, watching a big tournament is if you want to see whether Carlson's winning his game. Um, you can have a look kind of at the computer evaluation and uh, and see what the moves are, or you can turn the computer off because you can just turn it off um, and just see what you think yourself on um, on that. So it's it's quite nice for spectators to be able to kind of instantly follow a lot of games at once um, and look at what's interesting going on um, in those games. Also, top players um, use computers a lot in their preparation before the game. So. Um, they might be studying um, which openings to play. Um, and now, now, I mean, even that is an art in itself of how, yeah. how best to use a computer um, to prepare for a game. Because you can, you can find a position you're interested in playing and then get the computer to analyze it. The problem is you have to remember all that analysis. So it'll, <laughs> it'll, generate, it'll generate a stack of outputs about what, what moves to play. Um, and actually, uh, you won't necessarily, even the top players, won't necessarily be able to remember all of that. So the skill is in kind of setting the computer on a, a position where it can kind of teach you the, the, the ideas or you can remember, you have to set it at the level where you can kind of remember yeah. <laughs> um, what the outputs are. The other thing, uh, though, with Alpha Zero and with the traditional computers is this different in style. So uh, Alpha Zero might look for these positions where um, it's going to get a, a sort of a slow build up of an attack or a positional advantage. It can sacrifice lots of things. The traditional engine uh, is a bit more calculation heavy, can work out a precise calculation sequence. What's interesting to do is, is play the two against each other. And so you can see this clash of styles and you can say you're interested in a particular position from the white side. You could play, have Alpha Zero playing white and Stockfish playing black. Then you could switch it all round. Uh, it wouldn't be Alpha Zero, actually, to be accurate. It'd be um, Leela Zero, which is a oh. 
a kind of open source version, basically using the same techniques to program it um, as Alpha Zero was, um, and Leal Zero is now extremely strong. Actually, there is a um, computer chess world championship going on uh, yeah, at the moment. Uh, so top chess engine championship, and that's Leela Zero, which is um, the, the the one basically designed like Alpha Zero against Stockfish. So they're um, those two are, are, are playing it now, and they've been set um, lots of different opening different openings to play. Um, yeah. So you can kind of see how what their take is on various different positions, and that's a lot of fun to follow as well. I imagine that um, there is actually a huge. Uh, well, it's a huge resource there because it, w watching this, uh, the Queen's Gambit, which is the you know one of the things that's launching chess back into huge popularity, maybe even you know to front yeah. pages of newspapers like it was in the seventies, yeah, yeah. which you know we could get there again. Um, is the fact that you don't now have to sit on a telephone line to four other kind of grandmasters who are all helping you to plan your moves, and actually you can use this computer as a as an aid actually just just much easier for everybody it does help access because um before you you might you might have to know the right people or be from the right country in order to have access to the best resources whereas now it's a, a little bit more even because pretty much everybody will have access to to the computers and you can then use that to, to help you study well and you can you can just it. play online as well there's something that's different from when i was growing yeah. up you can type in online chess and within five seconds you're playing a game i did that yesterday i couldn't believe it it's either. amazing isn't it yeah and you've got this you've got a, a variety of sites you can use you can pick your time control you can find someone of similar strength to you you can try your luck against someone who's stronger than you um yeah yeah it's it's absolutely amazing 24 hours a day whenever you feel like it and you don't have to travel to that person or, or or anything like that so it's just so much better access and also if you've only got half an hour to play chess you can still do it um and and you can play it if you're depending on what speed you like to play you can play a few games in half an hour come back when it suits you and and play again so it's 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 very nice for people you know we've all got even though we're locked down we've all got busy yeah. lives still yeah. and um and 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 still you can kind of time your chess playing when it suits you um, and, and you can always get a game, yeah. When our uh, chessboard eventually arrives after this uh, huge delay, yeah. because obviously so, it's so popular, I'm going to be playing my wife at home. What it's tips can you give me or her to kind of try and become better than just um, a beginner? Because I think we, all, we, know, we know the moves yeah. of the board, and I've played a bit as a kid, but what are some of the ways of improving your game um that, that are kind of to start with quite easy yeah so so there's there's kind of tactical ideas i suppose and positional ideas so so tactics is is kind of making sure your pieces don't get taken unexpectedly and um and that sort of thing and for that it's quite nice to do um puzzles of the right les level for you um and it, so it might be where, where can is there a checkmate in one in this position and you can um and th there's a lot of this online so you can kind of uh find puzzles and 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 just practice them and actually some even some of the really top players have got hooked on um doing puzzle after puzzle and trying to improve their rating on the on the puzzles so so that's nice for tactics playing lots of games is is always going to help watching actually watching games is, is there's um lots of competitions on some of them are commentated which can help your understanding um and then there's also uh books you can read about strategy well tell us about your um, book because i know you co-authored this book and it um it's been doing really really well and i'm imagining loads yeah. of people are now thinking i want a book about chess to, to, to yeah. you know about the story of chess and, and its developments yeah. as well as positional play so the one that you co-authored tell us just give yes, us a flavor so of that co-authored this with um, English Grandmaster Matthew Sadler um, and we wanted to bring sort of both the story of Alpha Zero and also the examples of its games um, in chess so it's called Game Changer published by New in Chess and uh, and so the first part of the book it has um, an interview with Demis Hassabis the CEO of DeepMind about how he runs his um, his AI uh, program and and uh, we sort of talked also with um, people who work there um, about AlphaZero. And then you've got a bit about how 
alpha zero, we say how alpha zero thinks yes. um, <laughs> is, is it's kind of about its algorithms and its neural nets uh, then we also have and kind of the bulk of the book is um, a whole load of chapters on themes from alpha zero's play so alpha zero can't describe to us uh, you have to Put your rock on an open line that sort of thing you need uh, to interpret what what's exactly happening. You, you need to interpret what you see in the games right. and um and uh my co-author grandmaster matthew sadler he was did a lot i mean he played through all these games um and was pulled out themes of um what's happening in the play one 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 big thing it did a lot more than the top players at that time was push its H pawn. So the far pawn, which you're told actually as a beginner, and it's rightly so, you're told not, not to, to do that. Yeah. push that at first because you've got to get control of the center, whatever. What Alpha Zero does is gets the control of the center, sorts its position out, and then it uses this H pawn for an attack. So we did a chapter on um, the advancing this H pawn to, to make an attack. And what's really lovely now is that loads of the top players have started playing it. So, for example, Magnus Carlsen and, and lots of the other players have started doing these Alpha Zero type attacks. So we've got a chapter on that, a chapter on, I mean, Alpha Zero sacrifices pawns a lot. Um, it also uh, kind of does, it lines up a rook and a bishop against the king, brings in a knight and then pushes this H pawn up the board um, and does its attacks this way. And that was how it was getting a lot of these wins Um against Stockfish. So we've got all these games and then also parallels to historic players and um, how, for example, um, Kasparov played a game similar to an Alpha Zero game. And so it sort of shows how human understanding is developed along with the um, computer understanding. I mean, another fascinating thing actually is on the um, openings it chooses to play. So like the first few moves of a game. And um, it, it what you can, what what they, what DeepMind published was also some snapshots of as it taught itself what openings it was trying out, and oh, you could see that they started off these not very good openings at all, and <laughs> and then it, it kind of picked what its favourite ones were. So, um, Bobby Fischer has a famous quote about e4, so your king pawn, uh, best by test, he says. Um, actually, Alpha Zero doesn't choose e4; it chooses d4 as its first move or knight f3, um, and it goes for so it's a slightly more positional game I suppose um, and then and then turns it into an attack uh, but the, the other thing is it's it's sort of discovered independently some of these openings that are regularly used by the top players right. and that might have only been discovered in the last 20 years or so um, it it does these so there's there's this famous drawing kind of line that we called um, the Berlin defense and Alpha Zero also plays this um, Berlin defense that was discovered by Kramnik. And, right. and, and so there's, there's, there's all these openings that um, it has played that are, uh, are also current in top chess. Uh, it's also come up with sort of new ideas that yeah. the top players are trying out. Computers are essentially changing the, the face and the, the nature of chess in the sense that if a computer can confirm that an opening is good, because yeah. you know one of the things that daunted me slightly when I was trying to get a, a leg up on my wife on chess was that I looked up yeah. some some openings and there's so many openings. You know they're That's obviously true. popular You're ones, right. but there's a lot yeah. of kind of learning. But I guess if you've got the computer kind of suggesting that this works, uh, you know, and, and is a good starting point, can you see that yeah. in the future? Uh, if, as computers get even more powerful, that actually there might be even newer openings that, that are discovered. Yeah. So definitely there's new, there's, yeah, even now with the computers they're on now, they're discovering, making discoveries in opening theory. Um, and it has affected the human game. So, um, for example, the top players now would not choose to just play one single opening and, and play that each time. What you'll see is a lot more variety. So for any any of the top players, they'll, they'll have a big variety in which openings they learn um, and they know. Um, and and so they'll they'll so then they're always looking for new ideas in in lots of different openings at the same time. Um, they might have a team of people to help them uh, to help them interpret what the computers are coming up with. Um, they'll also use the computers themselves and uh, and they'll try out lots of different stuff. So it's a very creative time, actually, within chess at the moment. Is the Queen's Gambit any good? Because I've never played the Queen's Gambit as a... Oh, actually, the Queen's Gambit as an opening, yeah, yeah. Because it is, it's quite... The TV series makes you think it's quite a rare, rarely used opening. No, no, um, no, it's, 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 it's a common one. Um, yeah. Normally they don't take it, so you so the Queen's Gambit... So Gambit you can decline or accept it, can't you? That's the, Yeah, yeah. So there's, this, there's also a King's Gambit. There's a King's Gambit and a Queen's Gambit. And the King's Gambit 
I quite like the King's Gambit actually, but this is considered really bad. Um, and, and, and so you, you're playing the pawn in front of the king and then the pawn next to that, you let them take it and you go for an attack. Um, however, you do kind of weaken your king's position. Queen's yeah. Gambit's a different story. I don't, I don't really play this one, but it's, 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 sure. it's considered very good. Um, you, you play your pawn in front of your queen and then the pawn next to that. Um, let them take it, but but if they do, they can't usually hold on to the pawn, or else they have to compromise their position a bit in order to to hold on to that pawn. I see. Um, also, they or they might decline it. The queen's gambit declined is quite um, a common opening. In in that, then they they don't take the pawn, and then you get a normal game. <laughs> yeah, obviously we're locked down, and people are playing chess. I think a lot more. Um, yes. How would you hope that that would kind of just help to cope with this time? Because you know, it's something that we're looking really looking forward to. Just playing a board game. Again. No, it's definitely it's, it's it's lovely to be able to have this a sort of extra thing you're doing, and you could do it, you know, every day, set a time each day, and and play a bit, and try and watch your watch your strength improve. Um, really, really nice. And and what we've also found, we we um, because of course you can't play over the board anymore, and everybody's missing that. Yeah. Um, what we had recently was the online British chess championship. So we still managed to have a championship. Um, it was sponsored by Kaplan. They, they they kind of made that all happen. And I was one of the commentators um, for that event. Um, and, and what was really nice was that actually uh, there was like women's event, junior event, and actually in the women's event and, and yeah. following the Queen's Gambit maybe, but we found a lot of players who hadn't played for a number of years came back because it was online and convenient. Also a lot of junior players played. And so we got actually a really very vibrant women's championship there um, with new players and old players mixing, all the age groups mixing. Um, and, 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 and one young girl she, she, uh, called Nina Pert, she did brilliantly. She came second in the whole event. And so it was, it was sort of um, allowed um, sort of new talent to shine um, in a way you, you actually might not have seen that um, with, with over the board chess so it does give some new opportunities as well to people um and and anyone as well could could join in that event and there were qualifiers so you had a chance of playing against some of the really top players as well it's really interesting that actually because it's an online environment and i m my understanding is that you know when we're talking 50s 60s 70s that women weren't really as welcomed in the game as perhaps yeah. you know nowadays and i wonder if maybe that's something that you might have come up against in in your career even so um yeah i mean i mean even though it's it's welcoming for women, it's still very much the minority of of players, and and hopefully the Queen's Gambit will change that as well and make it a little bit more accessible. And I think online can also make it accessible for women who might be very busy with lots of things at once, and 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 then actually can can play, but um, only at certain times or only you know a certain number <laughs> certain number of times a week or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so so I think that that's nice. Um, and it's sort of encouraging for women players. And, and I think there's a lot of um, movement amongst male players as well to be more encouraging to, to female players and that it does matter that there is participation there and, and that it's a, a sort of welcoming environment. And not just male, female, but for, for any, yeah. any groups of people. Yeah. Well, I hope it goes from strength to strength. And uh, yeah, we'll see, see who wins out of my, my wife and myself. <laughs> but, uh... Yes. Yes, thank good luck so to both of you. Yeah, we'll... Make sure you enjoy it, obviously. Yeah, we'll... yeah. Thank you so much for that, Natasha, and thank you for yeah. joining us. Thank you. Thanks to Natasha Regan and her book Game Changer is available now. We'll be back soon with another episode of the podcast. In the meantime, thanks for listening. That's Check and Make. Check and Make.